When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. Hey, guys. It's Quinn. We are back today in our Good News series with a seriously actionable and helpful and revealing and, dare I say, actually (laughs) pleasurable way of looking at the world. Uh, And that comes from our delightful conversation uh, with Bina Venkatraman. She is the editor of the Boston Globe's editorial page and the author of The Optimist's Telescope, Thinking Ahead in a Reckless Age. Um, which, yes, seems insane right now. Uh, Of course, it was written and even released before COVID showed up, uh, but it is actually even more applicable now than ever. Uh, Chaos is not going anywhere. Um, If a failure to plan and to execute on a theoretical plan or to capitalize on anything, uh, forgetting all the negligence, whatever, if all of that is what got us into this position, Bina asks, how might we mitigate losses caused by short-sightedness, which feels pretty damn appropriate. Um, If you want some counsel in figuring out how to plan your own future, uh, your families or your companies, how to, not necessarily the plan to take, but what are the guideposts you should be using? Uh, Let this conversation and Bina's awesome book be a starter guide in asking better questions. Enjoy. Welcome to Important, Not Important. My name is Quinn Emmett. And I'm Brian Colbert-Kennedy. This is the podcast where we dive into a specific topic or question affecting everyone on the planet right now in the next 10 years, which is kind of the entire point of today's conversation. Uh, Mm -hmm. If it can kill us, or most of us, or turn us into data from Star Trek, we are in. Uh, Our guests are scientists, doctors, engineers, politicians, astronauts, even a reverend. And we work towards uh, action steps our listeners can take with their voice, their vote, and their dollar. This is your friendly reminder that you can send questions, thoughts, feedback, drawings uh, to us on all, ple- mostly cookies, to us on uh, Twitter at importantnotimp or email us at funtalk at importantnotimportant.com. Uh, and you can actually also leave us, uh, uh, a, you know, complimentary or threatening uh, voice messages uh, at the link in our show notes. To be clear, you can't send cookies to any of these things, but if you right. do make great cookies, uh, send us a note and we'll give you the correct address. Yeah, we'll would, figure something that'd out. That'd be great. Yeah, I mean, clearly, of well, you'll go, you, you can go pick them up. You can also join thousands of other smart people and subscribe to our free weekly newsletter. comes out Fridays most of the time uh, at importantnotimportant.com. Uh, this week's episode is talking about how crazy shit is out there. We recognize that. We see you. But despite uh, all of that, turns out you can actually uh, plan for the future and save the world uh, at the same time. Amazing. Uh, we have with us this week uh, Bina Venkatraman. She's the author of the forthcoming book, The Optimist's Telescope. It is uh, Great. Uh, Brian actually found out that's not a real telescope. I thought it was a telescope. Yep. Uh, he was bummed for a little a bit, uh, but he's excited again because Bina's awesome. She really was fantastic, and I'm excited for this book, and I love that she uh, wants to... Uh, well, I, the episode's great. <sighs> good, I don't want to spoil good. anything, you know? That's great. We used to do that, and people didn't like that. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And I was about to again. They, they would say, why, why did you talk about it when you're about to talk about it? <laughs> we were young. We didn't know. Yeah, that was years ago. Okay, here we go. Let's go talk to Bina. Okay. Our guest today is Bina Venkatraman, and together we're going to talk about planning for chaos, strategies when it's basically Mad Max out there. Bina, welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. We are very happy to have you. 
Bina, if you don't mind, why don't you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm Bina Venkatraman. I'm the author of The Optimist Telescope, Thinking Ahead in a Reckless Age, new book. And I teach in the program on science, technology, and society at MIT, where I brainwash young college students. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You're one of those people. Perfect. Like good Perfect. brainwashing, though. Right, right, right. It's different. <laughs> we, need to, we need some good brainwashing these days. I'm sure that's what Lennon thought, too, but... Mm, oh, no. Anyways. Uh, uh, that sounds great. We are, yeah, we're, again, we're so happy to have you. This is going to be a great combo. And then uh, just as a reminder to everyone, and so you know, I don't know if we talked about it before the uh, before recording, but uh, we're we just going to go over some... Oh, we did. Great. I was listening. We're going to go over <laughs> some uh, context uh, for, our, for our question uh, and our topic today and then dig into some uh, action-oriented questions that get to the core of uh, why we should all care about it and you and what we can all do uh, to support you. Sound good? That's great. Awesome. Bino, we like to start with one important question to set the tone for things. And I know you said you listened to some episodes. So one, my apologies uh, for all that time you can never get back. And two, <laughs> you cheated a little bit. But if you could, could you just <laughs> tell us um, why you are vital to the survival of the species? <laughs> Am I? Um, no, I mean, That's I think, for you to I, answer. <laughs> I, I think I'm I'm vital because everyone's vital to the survival of the species. I think if to be alive today, where we're facing critical tipping points, the, the melting Arctic, the rising seas, uh, we're all right. If you think about us in the fabric of time, if you think about the generations of people alive today, we have such extraordinary power to shape the future. We have such extraordinary power. Um, to do things at scale, the scale of the planet. And we know about what we're doing. We know the half-life of our radioactive waste. We know uh, how long our pollution is going to linger in the atmosphere and heat up the planet. And so I think as one among many, uh, it's, it's sort of like we all have to act. It's going to take action at all different levels to do something about it. Uh, that said, I just had a friend tell me, she said, you need to be the nightingale. And I was like, what? I kind of looked at her like she was smoking something and she wasn't, she was sober. <laughs> and what she said was, um, you need to sing the song that people feel in their hearts, but haven't yet brought into sound, into words. You sure and she wasn't smoking? <laughs> no, I'm sure. Um, but you know, this idea, and she said, that's how the revolution starts. And that was how she ended it. Like oh, with one nightingale singing to another nightingale. I know I was like, no pressure. I just have to sing the song that's in people's hearts. Um, but <laughs> I, I think if I think of like the ideal case of, of the book I just wrote, I mean, yeah, I hope I am like bringing to words and bringing to action, like the deepest, highest aspirations that we have to actually care for the future, actually be good ancestors for future generations, be remembered as the people who who actually saved the planet instead of instead of cursing it. You said something in there I'm going to come back to, but I'm not going to give it away yet. But I'm curious, uh, and maybe I should ask your friend this, but I want to ask you, why do you feel, before we get into things, why do you feel uniquely suited to be the nightingale to do this specific job to write this book and and brainwash all these young people. Why you? Uh, if not me, then who? Um, I think I think I've been I've been thinking about the future, and I've been connected to. I guess the, I've I felt the connection between the fate of humanity and the fate of the planet as something that I. I mean, I just sort of grew up with an intuitive sense of that, and. Uh, I've been thinking about it, studying it, acting to try to uh, address it for basically my entire professional life in one way or another, uh, though it's looked very different depending on where I've been, if I've been in government or if I've been a journalist in a newsroom. Uh, and so I think one of the things that I bring to the table is a sense of connecting what we actually believe in and sort of value and want to do as human beings and uh, not being willing to accept that the way that we're doing things now is how it has to be. I actually think that we have far greater capacity than we give ourselves credit for as individuals, as communities, and as a society. And so I think it's a combination of my stubbornness to accept <laughs> the world as it is and my, I guess, creativity and uh, passion to, to make a difference. I love that. Um, I, I feel like stubbornness is pretty necessary these days, you know, 
things are going down the pipe pretty quickly in a lot of directions. And we need people who are just like, yeah, no, it's not, it's not going to fucking happen. I'm, right. I'm going to stand yeah. in the way of this. And so it's the, um, uh, it's, it's the Lord of the Rings. You shall not pass. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. I need a cape like that. It's like, Oh, definitely get a cape. Brian yeah. will definitely make uh, you a cape. And maybe a beard. Do you think I could grow a beard like that? We cape, can, beard, staff. Yeah. Different podcast. We can get into it, but you're going to need a <laughs> staff that glows on demand, a cape for sure. And yeah, I, I'm into it. Um, so I, I love that. Let, let's talk a little bit about our, uh, a little context for today. And and as usual, and everybody else knows, this is like a very poorly put together and not edited Wikipedia article. Like the old Wikipedia, when your parents are like, you can't use that for your homework, it's not reliable. Usually I go into to sort of a generalist's take on some technical subject of which I've just learned, like uh, pediatric cancer or ocean acidification or uh, the uh, relatively successful standardization of uh, British health records or some monsoon uh, or it's less wonky. It could be more contextual history or sort of an, uh, a monologue uh, on ethics about a recurring pandemic or, or soil or why we, it's insane that we keep having to tell people that we need more young women and people of color in science because how the fuck is that not obvious by now? But instead of that, today I think we just uh, get right into it. Because if you if you listen to this podcast, if you're cognitively awake, technically in any capacity, you're you're seeing and hearing and feeling some, uh, as we like to say, existential-ish shit that's probably stressing you the fuck out every day like the rest of us. How do you deal right now? More importantly for today, how the hell are you supposed to plan for a completely unpredictable, sure looks dark out there future, right? You probably uh, end your day like a lot of other folks uh, binging something like Handmaid's Tale or Black Mirror. And and five years ago, you're like, boy, that's scary. And now you're like, that doesn't look bad compared to fucking Twitter today. <laughs> and and that's why I'm I'm thankful for people like Bina and, and to have this conversation today, because she is uh, clearly the expert. And after reading the book, I feel in such safer hands that she's going to plan everything else for me uh, <laughs> for, for planning for, for all this chaos. Um, Bina, I, I have to say there there is one thing that stuck out to me uh, very early. So we talk to a lot of exceptional individuals on the show and and many are driven to do what they do not for profit or fame though those are sometimes uh, not always byproducts of their work. Uh, they do them for good because it's the right thing to do uh, to either create a better future or prevent a much worse one. Uh, and so sometimes uh, since we're always pushing towards action and trying to practically inspire folks uh, and young listeners, I'll ask something like, Bina, is there a specific relationship you can point to that was a catalyst for your actions to get you where you are today? Um, but before I ask you that, or, or, or instead, could you for us tell me, uh, t t read for us the dedication in your book, that, that first page? Sure. Uh it's for my parents who crossed oceans for the sake of the future. Uh, I loved that so much. Um, mm -hmm. To me, it is the perfect encapsulation of what parents do for their children. Uh, but at the same time, the task before us. So I would love if you could talk to me a little bit about how your parents uh, have informed your work and life thus far uh, and why they have inspired you to continue to look down the road. Yeah, Thank you. And thanks for sharing that you feel that way as well. But uh, my parents came to this country. My dad in particular uh, came to the U.S. from South India. He was the first in his family to come at a time when he couldn't afford to call home. Uh, he would send letters or uh, telegrams back home that would, you know, there were sort of like weeks that went in between hearing from his parents uh, when he came. So he has a kind of typical or let's say stereotypical American dream story. He came with $7 in his pocket. Why does everyone have $7? I just want to know. Yeah, like, I'm so confused. Is that like, number? is someone just give them an envelope with that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And he didn't have, um, he didn't have a driver's license, but he realized at some point, cause he was in Toledo, Ohio, that uh, he needed to be able to drive a car. And so he went to look at this woman's used car and she was like, okay, it costs whatever, like $100, whatever it was when he finally had that money. And he said, um, 
okay, I'll buy it, but you have to teach me how to drive. <laughs> um, so he did like, he had some incredible people who helped him along the way. And my mom came over a few years later. Uh, they had an arranged marriage that crashed and burned, but that's another story for another podcast. <laughs> um, but uh, also first in her family to, to sort of um, uh, live in the United States. And so they... They were both just so future oriented in how they raised us. They, my sister and I, they, um, you know, everything was invested in our future education. Otherwise, uh, they've always sort of, you know, they were the kinds of parents that would sacrifice sort of their own comforts and things that they wanted to to make sure that my sister and I would do well in the world. And uh, with my mom, that really manifested a lot in her like being my number one cheerleader. My mom is a physicist, so she's <laughs> she's she was not at all like sort of uh, the kind of mom who had like low standards or was like easy <laughs> to emulate. But uh, she she was a college professor. She always brought really interesting students and faculty homes. And there were always, and there were really interesting speakers that would go to her college. And she would always make sure she dragged me along to hear Bill McKibben come speak at the College of Worcester or Jane Goodall. Uh, and she just was like my biggest champion and she remains so today. Um, well, <laughs> I, I love that. I mean, I, I've got a few small, crazy uh, children in my life and, and <laughs> I joke sometimes, uh, you know, they're going to grow up and say, dad, what did you do when, when the chips were on the line and the apocalypse was coming? And I'll say, I started a podcast and there will be horrified at, at my level of commitment. But, uh, it, it, you're the nightingale. No, that's, uh, <laughs> nobody <laughs> wants that, but thank you. But it, it does, it does stick with me though, you know, cause they're old enough to start asking, oh my God, so many questions. But at the same time, you know, who, who crossed oceans stuck with me. Cause that's what we try to do every day. Right. Right. And I think there's a lot in our culture right now that's encouraging us uh, to sort of focus on the immediate. And part of it is, I think, our dread about the future. It's sort of like, well, if the world's going to hell in a handbasket, as you guys put it, uh, I'm just going to like get, get what's mine here and now. Sure. Um, but there's so many of us, whether we're parents or people who are just aware of the future, who really are willing to and have the aspiration to cross oceans for the sake of the future. Mm -hmm. And I think it's sort of like, we're kind of at odds with where our culture and society is at the moment. But I actually think there's a huge potential to actually take that, what our aspiration is and make it reality. Uh, and your story, um, your line reminds me of one of the posters I saw. I was in DC for the climate march that happened in April, 2017, soon after the, uh, the Trump presidential election. And there was this beautiful hand printed poster of a father sitting on a chair and kid and they're sort of in scuba suits, like a steampunk style of scuba suits. And he says, the kid says, daddy, where were you during the climate wars? Uh, so yeah, that really, um, that image has stayed with me. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's that kind of provocative shit that's going to stick with people and, and really, um, start the fight, right? I mean, everybody loves after all these protests, whether it's science or the women's march or whatever, it's those signs where people go, wow, they just, they just went out there and carried that sign around, huh? That's okay. I guess that's where we are is people are that fed up that they're willing to go, you know, write this or that or whatever it might be. It's, right. Yeah. We have yeah. to, we can't, can't mince words anymore. And I, I, I just loved your, your writing so much before we really get into the meat of the book. And, but there's something that did stick with me on this sort of, again, long-term uh, long-term sort of ethos of the whole thing. And, and you, you said it before there's, there's a phrase in there and it's also in the intro from your publisher that they sent along, uh, which is what if even in this reckless age, we could choose to value the future and become quote unquote, better ancestors. I love that because it implies not only what we've been talking about, which is forward thinking, uh, but the idea of, making a leap to the future and then looking back and asking what sort of legacy do I want to leave? You know, if people later are building on our shoulders, like what are those shoulders made of? What did, what did we, what did we do to, to move this along? Like for this comes to mind, like for Mitch McConnell, it would be uh, something like, you know, bankrupting democracy and the only <laughs> livable planet that we're aware of uh, until, 
you know, some futuristic seafaring nation arises from the seas uh, over what were, you know used to be New York uh, to, to give representative government another shot. <laughs> but for someone else, it could be something different. Sure, hopefully. that's his motto. <laughs> Mitch McConnell is an invertebrate. You have to give it, you know, I'm not sure he's capable of this kind of thinking yet. It's I mean, this true. It takes a prefrontal cortex, but... Yeah. Um, but what does it mean to for you? you I, so yeah. that's <laughs> his <laughs> mantra. And he's like, this is what I want my children to think I was made of. So, uh, Bina, what, is, what does that phrase mean to you? And, and, and practically, as again, we're working towards practicality, how does that influence your own long-term planning? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a lens I use with a lot of the decisions I make uh, personally, but mostly in my work. And, you know, it's interesting because I don't have kids and I decided not to have kids. But I, by the way, I have like seven godchildren and two nieces. Or it's, actually, an, like, it's enough. A bunch of nieces and nephews. Yeah, a bunch of young people whose future I'm personally invested in. But also, I sort of see my role as an ancestor as much more about our shared future, like all of our children and grandchildren. And um, I see that the role I need to play is um, about nurturing the future, but in a much more broader sense of our community. And um, it's why I work on problems like climate change. It's why I think about and write about uh, tools like gene editing, which I think have incredible potential to be heirlooms that we leave to the future, because if those that knowledge and those tools can be used to prevent and cure disease, that's great. But it's also sort of the kind of heirloom that you have to think about carefully. So you're not, um, you know, we could, for example, uh, edit out traits out of the entire human species. Like we have that power and capacity um, to change the whole future of our species. And when we hold that power, I think we need to think of it as as ancestors. And that means not just thinking about what diseases are we going to cure today? How are we going to engineer the perfect embryo so the next child that's born is is perfect in X, Y, and Z way? We actually have to be thinking about it from the perspective of like, what does that do to the human genetic pool? Are we decreasing diversity? How are we going to change and have, what are the potential un- unintended consequences of using technologies like that? So I think thinking of yourself as an ancestor also automatically kicks in like the kind of thinking the Trump administration doesn't want us to do right now when they are trying to get the national climate assessment not to look at climate models beyond Mm -hmm. the year 2040. Mm -hmm. When you think of yourself as an ancestor, you're thinking beyond the lives of your children and grandchildren, or your, in my case, my nieces and and their children. And Mm -hmm. And so it automatically implicates me in what happens, um, you know, in 2050 and beyond. And uh, when we think about, um, you know, the seas rising in Miami, or we think about frequent droughts or floods, the kinds of impacts that are predicted in our warming climate, when I'm an ancestor, right, my decisions today actually matter. It doesn't matter the fact that that those consequences are coming in the distant future doesn't mean I can discount them the way that, you know, economists and policymakers talk about discounting the future. Mm-hmm. I can't discount them in that way. Like, it's not a cold-hearted calculation because I actually have uh, obligations and values to those. Ju- um, I actually have obligations and I have, like, a deep, deeply held value to care for and steward resources like heirlooms to those generate future generations. And um, I hope you're gonna edit me so I sound better. I'm sorry, I'm like you sound so incredible. Are you kidding me? We're I'm just gonna speed just you like, up. We're just gonna speed it up really fast. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Um, so make me talk nope. really, really fast. <laughs> Keep it coming. Um, but you know, the thing is, like this sounds like this might sound like pie in the sky or like I'm like a super idealistic to be thinking in this ancestral way. But the reality is it's kind of a foundational universal value. And you can go back to Thomas Jefferson, who talked about um, leaving resources to the future unencumbered by the predecessors. So we should be stewarding things for future generations. Teddy Roosevelt spoke about uh, not letting a present day minority, uh, squander resources that belong to the future. Uh, Edmund Burke, who was this Irish political philosopher who was kind of the godfather of conservatism, wrote about society. His actual idea of society was a partnership among generations. Uh, there are these concepts like the public trust doctrine that are uh, sort of in democratic constitutions on multiple con- continents. And the idea behind the public trust doctrine is that there are certain resources that ought to be held in the trust for the common benefit of generations alive today, but also generations in the future. So this this kind of language and aspiration and ideal exists 
in cultures around the world, in our foundational documents of, of government and democracy. And the question is, like, how do we act on those aspirations? Because there's a big dis- disconnect between what we see in that language and what we feel in our hearts is our obligation to, to future generations and what we're actually doing today collectively. Well, it's interesting. I mean, because it does exist in so many different places. And at the same time, it's not even being considered in so many places or hasn't been recently, but I feel like people are feeling the need to go back to it. I mean, you look at, uh, like you said, reading the founders or reading Marcus Aurelius or, or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's all about that. It's all about long-term consideration and, and how, if you read those things now, how much it can influence your life. But most people, uh, read Twitter. They don't read the founders. They don't read those kind of things. You know, uh, f- Facebook is, you know, it has more control over most people's lives than any country. Uh, and their motto is move fast and break things, right? Where, right. where uh, think of move fast and break things versus the term better ancestor. And I think about, I, I, I'm a, um, a, a, a science nerd, but I'm a proud liberal arts major. And, and, and how many of these technological issues would be, would, would have never happened or would have been considered differently or rolled out with more attention to detail if there are things like a liberal arts major in chief at some of these companies who could say things like, I mean, almost forget better ancestor, but start with, should we do this? Why shouldn't we do this? <laughs> who right. will this affect? Who won't this affect? Will people benefit or is this, you know, things like that? And then you can get to better ancestor because it feels like they're so far from it. You know, yeah. I look at the other day, I mean, you know, we knew this was going to happen um, when when this uh, psycho got elected in, in Brazil and he was like, yeah, well, I'm going to cut down the Amazon. Turns out he's cutting down the fucking Amazon, like our, the, which is like our, our bulwark against climate change is, okay. is the Amazon. And it's all from, for cows that are going to be turned into meat because we right. can't stop eating meat. And it's right. like, what, what are we doing? Yeah, well, I remember when candidate Trump was still in the Republican primary field and he would say these outlandish things and people people would say, like really smart people would say on Facebook and, and people in my life would say, you know, he, he would never do those things, you know, he would never build yeah. a wall. That he doesn't never, mean it literally. You know, it's like, my line is always like, when they tell you what they're going to do, believe them, mm-hmm. you know, believe mm-hmm. them. Yeah. Because at the very worst, <laughs> at the very worst, you're planning for a scenario that, that will never come to pass, but you're still like, you know, prepared for that, for that to be the reality. And you're, you're actually taking them at their word. It's interesting what you were saying about the technology companies too, because I think that we do need to have building blocks towards this idea of being good ancestors. And for company, for a lot of companies today, and even for us in our lives today, I think a lot of this comes down to, or um, can be influenced by how we measure ourselves. Like, how are we measuring progress? How are we measuring success? Mm -hmm. And I go back to the story that the ancient Greek historian Herodotus uh, told, which may or may not have been true, but let's go with, it was maybe true. Nobody's going to check on it. Yeah, well, yeah, we can't fact check this one so easily, it turns out. But so there was a magistrate uh, in Athens named Solon, who was sort of this wise man of of Athens. Uh, He put into place all these incredible reforms in Athens, like banning the practice of enslaving people for their debts. Uh, He he, uh, expanded suffrage so that common people could vote. Uh, So really like some of the foundational reforms of democracy that remain in place today. Um, And so once he put those into place in Athens, he fled the country because he actually didn't want to be pressured. And there was sort of like a contract, like put these in place and for a period of 10 years, you can't erase them. And so he he left. And this part, by the way, about what he did in Athens is definitely true. Um, and then he went to, what Herodotus says is he went to Sardis, which is in modern day Turkey, and he met this king, King Croesus. And the king sort of took him on a tour of his palace and his riches and showed him like all his bars of gold and all of his, you know, wealth. And then at the end of the tour, he, he said to Solon, the king says, you know, who's the happiest man uh, in the world? And, or sorry, was it who's the happiest man? I think it was who's the happiest man in the world. And Solon said, you know, he, I think Croesus thought he'd like basically led the witness and that he was going to get the answer like, you must be because you have all this wealth. And Solon talked about the length of a person's life and how 
you can't measure um, a person's worth on any given day. And I think this is a lesson that like carries forth to today. And by the way, King Croesus ended up having like terrible luck. He lost his son and Solon named, you know, this guy who had died heroically in battle and who was survived by his children and grandchildren who all remembered him well, this um, general Tellus. And, um, and Croesus was really frustrated by that. But of course, his fortunes turned and he ended up being very unlucky. And so I think the, the lesson to carry forth is that you know we measure ourselves so much today in snapshots of time, and these technology companies are doing that very thing. We're doing that very thing when we're like mm-hmm. looking at how many likes we have on Facebook or how many uh, retweets mm-hmm. we have on Twitter, and that's not actually the measure of our value and our worth over time, right? So it starts with looking at like what's the value you're creating over the next five years of your life or the next ten years if it's a company. You know, is it just about your quarterly profit or is it actually about like what value you're creating for? shareholders and your founders, right, over a period, a longer period of time. And I think you can extrapolate that out to like the idea of legacy or the idea of leaving heirlooms. And actually, I, I much prefer the idea of heirlooms to legacy. We can go back to that if you want. Um, but if you don't, we don't have to talk about it. Um, so, but this, this idea that um, how we measure ourselves in this era, because we can we can gather so much data in every increment of like a little increments of time, we can look at like our heart rates in every second of every day if we want to. So I think we really have to resist, resist the urge to be measuring ourselves and what we do based on these little increments. And we have to be looking and taking a step back from that, all the, that data that we gather to, to ask ourselves what we're really doing and what really matters. Yeah, I, yeah. I love it. It's true. And, and, you know, it's so the, the data at some point will become helpful and will shed light on some things. It could prevent disease or, or, or show you that, Hey, look, you actually haven't, uh, you know, done anything, but gone for more than a walk for three weeks. You might want to get off the fucking couch. Um, um, <laughs> right. but that applies itself to a lot of different things, which is like, how do how do you, how do you use it? And how do you, you know, it's not a needle in a haystack if you're just looking at one needle and then one needle and then one needle. Um, it's, it's, or I guess the, the signal and the noise to it sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's, is it, what's the trend versus what is it telling you in the second, right? Yeah. Right. Um, and yet, yes, let's talk about heirlooms. Yeah. Speaking of, of them, uh, in, in, I think it was episode 20 of, of our, this show, uh, it was called how the hell are we going to feed 10 billion people? We talked with, uh, Fred Ayuti of the land Institute and you spent some time down there, which is so awesome. Can you tell us how, uh, agriculture lends itself to, to, uh, you know, this mantra of not cutting corners and of, uh, looking forward to, to building a, a better future? Yeah, I had so much fun at the Land Institute. I hung out a lot with uh, Wes Jackson, who was on the verge of turning 80 at the time, who was the wow. founder of the Land Institute, and talk about a visionary guy. Um, so, And also just really funny. He likes to say things like, I have Methodist in my madness. Um, and he, <laughs> so, um, so I think like what they're doing there is really interesting, right? So what we're doing now, if you think about agriculture, here we are, you know, we're going to push... Um, 9 billion people on the planet. And uh, we need to figure out how to feed them all. And at the current rate, we're depleting fertile soils around the world. And the way that most crops are grown is to boost annual yields, which is a very, by the way, incremental measure of what they're worth. Like, you know, you can strip, you can be stripping the soil and boosting it with fertilizers and irrigation using vast resources to get your crop for that given year. But over time, you might be eroding the ability of that land to feed people in the future. And so what I think is so interesting about what the Land Institute is doing is bringing this mentality, I think, of heirlooms and um, ancestral thinking to what they're doing with, um, for example, they're interested in reclaiming some of the ecosystem of the ancient prairie. Uh, which can which has these grains that are perennial. Uh, and so they've bred perennial grains and tried to boost their annual yield so that they'll still be profitable for farmers in the short run to grow, but uh, so that those perennial grains have deeper roots that are anchoring the fertile topsoil, requiring less fertilizer and irrigation to grow, and trying to wed that really futuristic thinking about what's going to feed people in the future with what the present day demands of the market are. And I find that to be a really creative way around this conundrum where sometimes it's like, well, we just need to do what's needed in the short term to stay afloat, right? We need farmers to survive. We need to actually be able to feed people now, but we need to bring in that kind of future thinking. And so I think sometimes there's ways to kind of combine those 
things into one. And I'll give you a, a sort of more person, like sort of individual example of that. There are these programs now that are linking uh, lotteries with savings because um, it turns out that savings rates are really, really low among low and middle income Americans, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is also true in a lot of other parts of the world. And it's really hard for people to save. But in those demographics, you also find um, a fair number of people playing the lottery. And actually the lottery is like heavily subsidized by the poor, which is almost like a regressive tax. Because it's Mm -hmm. like there's people in our society are ending up paying for government services by like playing the lottery. And there's some creative groups out there, including a group called Commonwealth based in Boston that have worked with folks like the Michigan Credit Union League to set up these schemes where people can, by putting money into a savings account, they get entered into these lotteries. And there are cash prizes that are drawn like every month or regularly. And that prospect of like winning something big now lures people into saving for their future. And wow. like normal gambling, they can't actually lose their money. They can only like pad their savings account. And it just like takes the interest and then the interest gets put into the lottery system. I love that. I mean, That's yeah, the lottery is a, it's a it's a fiasco. So as some way of turning that on its head is genius. Yeah, I mean, it's it's this idea of being creative about recognizing that there are a lot of short term demands. There's a lot of we do live in a culture of instant gratification. We need to do things at present, right? Like sometimes we don't have a lot of resources to put towards the future, mm-hmm. but through these kind of creative ways, including perennial grains and this like lottery savings approach, we can actually wed our future aspirations to what we need to do in the present. But we talk about not having resources dedicated to the future. And if you really look at where the money is sunk, you know, if you look at fossil fuel subsidies and go like, oh, we can't, uh, we got to, you know, phase out the electric vehicle, you know, $7,500 subsidy or whatever. And you go like, well, but wait a minute, there's a trillion dollars a year going to fossil fuels. Like we do have resources for a lot of these things. Uh, they're just being Absolutely applied do. in like yeah. it, these institutionalized horrific ways, um, yeah. which I recognize like it's going to be a battle to end those. I think we're on the way, but it's still like there's money to be freed up. Money can't do everything, but I don't know. You hope for from the ground up, from the top down, that we can start to get there. So you mentioned this a little bit. It's uh, it, it is it is rocky out there, right? This book wouldn't exist if it if it did, right? The current climate or or the climate of the literally the, the climate around us not uh, not our cultural climate but the actual climate uh and the climate of the last whatever since the last little ice age couple hundred thousand years it's actually kind of a blip right it's perfectly suited for for humans and we've fucking blown it in about a hundred years but it's not just it's not just uh, the environment under threat the rest of the climate is as well right are these uh we we were like oh monarchy is a nightmare we're going to try democracy we we ruined that as well. Some say it's kind of cyclical, but you actually spent some time uh, in the book, and I, I really liked this talking about how uh, the failure of government of past great societies wasn't and, and isn't necessarily inevitable, um, and how past societies uh, didn't have the tools we do, and, and this is what you mentioned now to track, uh, for example, antibiotic resistance. Now that we can, or you know, Google flu, or to look with satellites at, at deforestation live, like day to day, right? So, for example, for better or worse, we've got these satellites now that can see everything, every minute of the day, and they can create, use that information to create a historical database, uh, like we were saying, like all this data, look at the long term, and then we have these powerful computers and these algorithms that can parse all of that, yeah, weeks or years of it. And, and we get this comprehensive look, the most comprehensive look we've ever had of all of these interconnected systems. And then the computer says, basically, congrats, you ruined everything. You have 11 years to live, right? Um, I'm exaggerating, <laughs> but it's true. We, we, it, it, it doesn't have to be, it, we are, we've put ourselves in a very tough spot, even if, for instance, just on uh, carbon, if we stopped right now, uh, we would still, it would get worse for a while because it's baked in. Um, but it it isn't inevitable, right? There's all we always joke about the with the. Have you ever heard of the term the Great Filter, Bina? No. What oh is man, that? I feel like we could nerd out on this for a while. I'll send you this. Quinn loves the Great insa- Filter. Insane thing, I think. <laughs> it's so it's I proposed. Do, right? I, I can't remember. Was it Fermi? I think it was it part of Fermi's paradox, uh, like 40, 50 years ago. And I wrote this ridiculous thing on it that associated Ghostbusters with it because 
Sure. Um, <laughs> but the idea of the great filter is the question is, is uh, so Fermi's paradox was, all right, if there are all these, and this was like 40 years ago, now we actually know all these exoplanets are out there. If, if, uh, if there's other life out there, why haven't we seen them? Right. And there's all these answers, which is they're too far away. Uh, nothing can go faster than light. So we just haven't received that contact yet. Or by the time we receive it, it was 800 million, million years ago, like they're out of here. Right. Or there's nothing else out there. All these questions. If there, one of the further rabbit holes is if there's no one else out there, why? And uh, again, having all these incredible telescopes out there has taught us that there are actually planets in these habitable conditions or in these habitable zones, the quote unquote Goldilocks zones, where there'll probably be a small enough planet that's rocky and might be able to have water, which is kind of all we need. Um, but the question is, is if that's true, now we know even more, is there some sort of filter that every civilization runs into that snuffs it out? And is that, um, do they get to the point where their weapons are too powerful and they snuff themselves out like nuclear weapons? Is it, anyways, is it something else? And the question for humanity has always been, if, if let's say that theory is, is holds water. Are we past our great filter or are we just not there yet? And if the answer is it, it, apparently, and, and the more people dig into this and you can really nerd out on it is, was our great, if, if we've already passed it, that's great because we might survive this thing. Uh, you know, was our great filter leaping from single cell to multi-cell because the more we find out about that, more we found out how fucking random it was and impossible it was that we got to that point. Or, are we not to wear a great filter yet and and nukes are going to do it or climate change is going to do it? If the idea is that everybody has one, you know, the question is, do you get past it? Um, right. But so I, I'm exaggerating only slightly, but like you're saying, it's it's a ch it's a choice. It's more for us than, than ever before. And I, I would love to hear more about that because I would love to know what the fuck we need to do to skirt back from that little railing on the side of the cliff that we've really backed ourselves up against. Yeah, well, I love that way of thinking about it because it really it really forces you to reckon with the fact that there are threats we face that could be, right, that could be existential. Um, and we don't know for sure that they will be. We don't know what the great filter is. I think that's the the beauty of it. But the, the thought experiment the, that kind of allows that, I think the beauty of the thought experiment, not the beauty of the great filter, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but easy, that easy. It allows, it allows us to think about and and try to make actually life uh life on earth better for as many as many creatures and for ourselves as we as we can because it allows us to think about things that are not just existential but things that are pretty damn awful in general um too but so i mean i just i guess one of the things that i think about here is that so i call so i call this the time we're living in a reckless age and just it speaks to what you were saying because uh, unlike, you know, like the people who were in Pompeii before Vesuvius blew in 79, you know, we actually have ways to read the warning signs. Like you were saying, we have mm -hmm. satellite measurements. We have the record of warming, warm temperatures. We know the power of our nuclear weapons. We know uh, the power of artificial intelligence and gene editing. We can kind of like read the tea leaves much better than, um, than sort of previous civilizations that have been wiped out. And so that gives us this incredible potential, right? And, um, and the question is, like, how do we act on this, right? Our predictive power is so strong, but how do we actually act on the warning signs that we can save our civilization, so we can save what's best of humanity, so we can, you know, have a more just society, a society that doesn't have such stark inequality and isn't framing, fraying at the seams into conflict, which is, I think, where we're going right now. Mm -hmm. and, and so you can't, like, the reason we're reckless is because we actually have the evidence and we don't need to be acting on it fast enough. Um, that said, like what's implied there is that we have the choice because we have the knowledge and because we actually have the tools in a lot of cases to solve these problems. And I think with climate change, it's very much the case that we have the tools. And when I use the word tool, I don't mean just like the tech, like we have the hardware. I just, I feel sure. like people really need to expand their view of that. And a lot of it's about the human potential sure. of how we're going to solve these problems as communities. And I think, so... So one of the problems, right, like, why is it like we can have this knowledge of like the the polar ice caps melting and not act on it? And why can we like know um, and see, right, like our forest disappearing and not act on it? And I think one of the problems is when we think about the future, right, like the future is in 
our minds. Like we don't touch it. We don't sense it. We don't smell it. Uh, we conjure it in our minds. And one of the beautiful things about being human is that we can conjure in our minds. And, you know, if you talk to evolutionary psychologists and biologists about this and look at the experiments, it seems like we're one of the only, if not the only species that can actually do this, like literally imagine the future. So Mm -hmm. when a squirrel plans for the future, like by putting away nuts, that's more instinctually programmed. It's not like a vision of the future like we have, but, um, we're not exceptionally good at it, even though we can do it, do it right. And we, what we can imagine, like we're good at imagining, like I could win the Powerball, or you know, there might be a terrorist attack because people remember all the images of 9/11. There's a million movies about terrorist attacks, but we're not so good with imagining things we haven't experienced, like slow sea level rise that then makes storms really bad. Mm-hmm. Um, we're getting better at imagining it now that we've seen like Hurricane Sandy and we've seen Hurricane sure. Katrina and we've seen Bangladesh flooding and and all of that. But um, we're still like, like we're suffering from a deficit of imagination in how we think about the future and what's possible. And so I think a big part of how we act on this choice, like this choice we have to really like plan for the future and do better to avoid, right, the fate of these societies and these civilizations that have collapsed throughout history, even on our planet and probably on other planets for all we know, it is to like bridge that imagination gap and uh, part of what we have to do is not sanitize these threats of the future, but also have visions of the future that include uh, our agency. That So when we think about climate change, for example, a lot of times I feel like people only picture like the physical phenomena of like, you know, flooded streets of Miami, which by the way, you can see on a full moon anytime you want, but, um, or droughts and people being displaced and conflict and refugee crises. And that is all realistic in terms of what could happen under climate change. But I think if we want to actually get to the point where we're not just like turning away from these scenarios, we have to be also envisioning what we can do differently and how our society could actually be a society Mm -hmm. that addresses this problem. Like we need to have the positive visions of us solving the problem. And it's, um, I think of it as like an engaged form of optimism. It's not like believing that the world's going to be fine, but it's like having a picture of, of what we want society to look like and stepping back from that to ask how we do it. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, people are giving the Green New Deal such a hard time because they're saying it's going to cost trillions of dollars, at least on Fox News, they're saying that, which is a ridiculous proposition because it's not a policy proposal yet. It's just a political resolution, right? It's aspirational. Mm-hmm. Policy has to be put together on it. And, and then on the other hand, you know, people are just saying like, it's trying to do too much and And I I, I understand the criticisms, but what really um, compels me about it is that unlike other other responses to climate change we've had in the past, either at a policy level or at a political level, uh, that is is what I call like, it's like an aspirational vision of how society would solve major problems of inequality and climate change and involves um, picturing society as not just as it is now, but as it could be and as it could be better. So it's um, an animating vision that people can get behind with feeling like, oh, we have the agency to make this future a reality instead of just predicting like it's not just about the negative future, right? And it's not just about like things will be fine or we're going to keep things exactly the way they are because for a lot, we know for a lot, wide swaths of our societies around the world, things as they are, are not good enough. Sure. Yeah. And we, we it, it is incredibly simple and, and lazy to say, but you know, we, we have to harness that agency and use it because you know, these lobsters that are going further up the, the coast of Northeast America are like, boy, the water's warm. We should probably move up to Canada. They don't have any fucking idea why it's happening or that it's just going to get worse. We do, and we can do something about it. So we should. Right, we're smarter than lobsters. That's like someone used to make a bumper sticker. <laughs> smarter than lobsters. Smarter than lobsters. Let's go. But lo- you know what? Like lobsters are delicious. So let's They're not so like good. slam They're them so too good. much. So delicious. I live in New England. I'm so happy to have lobster. And speaking of lobster, I mean, one of these, um, one of these like really inspiring stories of what we can do to act more like ancestors uh, came from spending some time on the Pacific coast of Mexico with these lobster fishing villages. I was um, up and down the Baja Peninsula, which was so horrible, you know, just having to hang out. I'm so sorry about that. Fishing boats. I know. Feel bad for me. Um, And 
there's these communities have basically set up like their own way of collectively shepherding an heirloom, which is the lobster fishery. They've set up their own independent ways of policing the fishery. Um, they're very careful about what they catch, the size of lobster, so that they don't take the breeding lobster out of the oceans. Um, and they're effectively acting like ancestors with this resource of the fishery. Um, and you hear all these stories around the world of fisheries being destroyed. But there's actually people doing this the right way and and showing that it's possible to to act in this way that that conserves what we have for future generations. It's out there, right? I mean, wow. and, 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 you know, the, the simpler version is the, uh, and the less, uh, you know, generational, but, but someone has started to do something as you look at, you know, Os- Oslo, I think today, um, removed the last parking spaces downtown, um, because they just said, yep, yeah, we're uh-huh. gonna, we're gonna just, we're gonna fucking do this thing. We're just gonna get rid of cars. And they actually did it. And, and, and it's amazing. And it's like, you know, we can we can do it. We need to just start doing it. Yeah. And I think it's important to talk about that. I'm so glad you brought it up because I think we can feel, right, like the scale of this crisis, particularly the climate crisis, but like the many crises we fail, face uh, is just so large that it can feel so intimidating for one person to look at that. And I think you look at an example and you and then you could just say, oh, well, that's just Oslo. But as you amass all these examples, if you as you look around the world, which I did for my book, like you start to see that there's just like an incredible number of people and communities and businesses and organizations and even governments that are doing things that matter and that show show a model of how we can actually act in this way and actually plan for the future in this way. And, and what we need to do is learn from their example, replicate them, uh, and, and at, continue to, to build right, more examples of this so that they all become larger than the sum of the parts. We can do it. Just it seems it. It seems so so easy. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Bina, you, you know, we mentioned it before. You're clearly the nightingale, uh, or or the oracle from the Matrix. Um, but <laughs> oh, man, they're, they're... <laughs> I'm feeling so good about myself now. Mm-hmm. That's what we're That's here what for. we like to do here. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You know what are you know what are the biggest uh, obstacles that you run into? You know, where do you find yourself running into the ground, or 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 are there things that you're running from? <laughs> what am I running from? I haven't had to run from anything recently, but Good. you know, I do think like there's this tendency to to sanitize the threats of the future, right? Because um, it's easier to just focus on what's immediate and not take yeah. seriously these threats of the future. And so we have to we have to find ways to help people take them more seriously. And um, one that I came across uh, that I wrote about was using using role play games to help communities right like really contend with sea level rise so you give people a scenario and these games kind of occupy the space between fiction and reality because people are willing to kind of play the game so it's like you know if you go if you play monopoly like you're not actually like you're not gonna really like own atlantic avenue but like you suspend hold, your disbelief for the game on, hold on <laughs> Pretty sure I'm the owner of Atlantic Avenue. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. To look at you. I don't know. I'll be later. Um, but so, you know, and then they're playing the game and then they realize that these scenarios after the game's done, there was a study in nature done on this, that, that people then feel engaged and they feel actually more like they have an opportunity to plan for sea level rise in their community. This was done in like um, several communities. And so I think there are ways to help people really engage with these scenarios of the future in a way that makes them feel like there's something they can do about it and not just, right, like they're not just the victims in this doomsday that's coming. Right. Yeah. And well, uh, on that note, I think uh, we can start to work towards uh, how we can actually help folks uh, take action. Give them a little little preview of the book to come. Uh, Brian, you want to take us through that? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. We, you know, uh, what we like to do is lay out some some uh, ways that, that our listeners can uh, take action with their voice, their vote, and their dollar to help uh, support your mission and the our mission as a as a people. Um, so uh, let's let's get into it. H- how can uh, our listeners uh, support uh, you with their voice? You know, we like to if we can come up with some like big actionable specific questions that we could be uh, asking of our you know uh, local representatives um, uh, that 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 could help support you. Yeah, I think we need to be asking our politicians, candidates, we need to be asking them, what are they doing about problems that face future generations? What are they doing about climate change? How are they investing in education? What's their plan for not just the next generation, but the generation after that? 
um, we need to be holding them accountable for what they do to act, not just on immediate problems, but on future problems. So, I mean, and one thing I want to say about voting, and I hope I'm not like just going way off the rails of what you actually want here. So just <clears throat> please, that's what we do here. <laughs> reel me back in, reel me back in if I am. When you're thinking about voting, and especially in this upcoming presidential election, uh, do not like, right? Like, do not fall into the trap of failing to imagine what's possible. Uh, I feel like we are all reeling from the 2016 election still and with with due reason. Uh, but what's been what's happened in the past, right, is only so much of a precedent, right? We're, we live in unprecedented times. We never could have seen or envisioned, right, the Russians interfering in social media to manipulate our elections. We are facing unprecedented sea level rise. Uh, and so don't let... Um, the inability to imagine something different than what we've seen before in our political leadership keep you from um, embracing and voting for candidates that and ideas that you believe are right for this society, right? Like, let's not regress or retreat to um, what we've known before. Um, so that, I feel like, is a just important, like, lens to put on your voting and how you think about it. And, and with those candidates, right, like, we need to be really holding them accountable, asking even at the local level of our candidates, you know, what, how's, what are the consequences of this policy going to be for the next generation? Like, how should I be thinking about this uh, for the future, especially if you're young? And um, even if you're not, you're not young, you probably care. So if you're listening to this, you probably care. So um, I would just say, like, keep that lens of being an ancestor in in how you act and how you vote and how you think at that level. I think as consumers, as if you're if you consume, which you probably do, um, we all do. That's another way to really use um, your power, like looking at companies that actually are thinking long term about their impacts, looking at at their supply chains to figure out how they can do better environmentally and socially. I think it matters a lot. And I think we saw this with like Nike and the Colin Kaepernick, right? Like protests yeah. that they just responded to the fact that consumers have this incredible power and are outraged by what's what the NFL, how the NFL treated Kaepernick for taking a knee mm -hmm. uh, to protest injustice. And so I think that companies are responding to consumers who care and we need to continue to show them both that we care. But then I also like, I bought a pair of Nikes after that. I was like, I'm going <laughs> to company for doing this. And I think there are like different ways, different issues that like, depending on what you care about when it comes to the future, that you can find ways to support uh, the companies that are actually acting on those values. Yeah, that sounds about right. That's that seems pretty specific to me, and I don't. I'm not sure if we've ever really had uh, a voting uh, sort of perspective like that, which I think is is really helpful. Which is, you know, it goes back to earlier in the conversation, which was, you know, oh, he's saying all these things when he was candidate, and look, he did all of them after everyone said he's not going to really do that. It's 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 you use your imagination um, and and use it. Uh, you know, to imagine what would happen if he wins again, but also to imagine like what, what we can do. Um, and that's what I thought there was a great article and, and obviously there's 20 candidates. Uh, so everyone is still picking their own, including myself, but I loved, I can't remember, was it a New York times columnist who said, I want to live in Elizabeth Warren's America. Um, mm, right. And it is, it's, it's taking that and going like, Oh my God, like what if we had that? You know, and, and, and hers is obviously helpful because she's so <laughs> fucking specific about everything. And that's the right. joke, right? She's got a plan for everything. But it's but if you take a minute and you and you write a story in your mind about taking all of those things and imagining like, okay, four years from now, like what could that feel like? And it's like, holy shit, I want to be there. You yeah. know, I get it. And and do that. Do that. Find yeah. find who your person is. And then of course everyone has to get in line at the end or else we're gonna die. But right. And but what I worry about is like people aren't doing what you, what you're saying. They're actually like they're asking themselves like, yeah, but who's electable? Who's oh, really just, electable? They're right. still worried about what happened, right? And I get it. We're all worried, right? Like it's pretty fucking bad, you know. Sure. We don't like this, but we have to let our imaginations allow us to uh, inhabit a world in which we a candidate wins that does what we actually want for American society and what we want for the world. And the reason I say that is that there's no guarantee, right, that the past is going to be precedent. We don't know who's electable. Sure. Uh, all we know is what we care about and how we want to shape our society for the future. And if we're not willing to imagine it, then it's going to become self-fulfilling, right? We're never going to have that reality. Sure. And it's insane to, like, use these precedents of, of electability when the entire thing got thrown out last election. 
right? It's, right. It, and literally anyone can be president. But also, like you said, like we have to let ourselves do that. And and I'll use a phrase that has always stuck with me and, and people give it shit or they're inspired by it. And I know this one is close to you because you're old, uh, your old boss, but, you know, we have to have the audacity of hope. Um, yeah. Right? Yeah. Pretty, turns out he was pretty smart. Yeah. <laughs> so weird, right? <laughs> Fuck. Uh, wow. We blew it. But it's true. You you have to go in there and and have that and go like I I want to be there. What do I have? Who do I have to put to, to for us to get there? And from 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 getting cars out of cities, uh, you know, to punishing polluters, to to civil rights, to the the whole thing. You know, who do I have to do it and let yourself go? Like, oh my god, I'm going to work my ass off to get us there. Yeah, and I think because we are in such a time of despair, where our politics is broken, where our climate's warming, where inequality's rising, like these are the times where we actually need the courage to be that kind of optimist, right? We need, it, it's it's more important than ever that we don't just retreat into this incrementalism, like, let's just make it less bad. You know, we, this yeah. is when we lift our sights. And I think, I don't know, if your listeners can be brave enough to lift their sights like that, I will feel like I did a little, little mini Nightingale song. Oh, you're incredible. <laughs> hey, um, before we get to our uh, don't call it a lightning round last questions and get you out of here, uh, just why don't you pimp your book for a minute here? It comes out August yeah, 20, I was just gonna say August that. 27th, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. The Optimist Telescope comes out August 27th. This will come uh, out just before Labor Day. This will come out uh, probably right, but what day of the week is that? Uh, oh, Thursday. we're coming out August that 27th. Day. Uh, Wait, Are it's we? up to you. Do you want us to come out the week before or that day? Up to you. That day is great. I think I can ask the publicist when I walk out of here, and if she says differently, uh, I'll let you know. But that day sounds great. To be clear, she might also say, "Never, my God, <laughs> what did you do?" <laughs> she hasn't been listening, so she doesn't know what I said. So <laughs> oh, great, great, great. Let's get out of here. Um, all right, yes. Brian, take us home here. All right. First of all, thank you so, so, so very much for being here today. Sorry about all the microphone stuff, but you sound great. And this has been wonderful. So great. Oh, you guys are great. I love you. You're awesome. Oh, boy. The feeling is mutual. Uh, and maybe later when we figure out for sure when uh, when we'll put the uh, the episode up, you can let us know if you have any ideas, uh, anybody else that you think that we uh, could, could talk to. Uh, you mentioned, I think, some organization at the beginning of the discussion, actually. So if there's anybody that you think we could talk to, world changers like yourself, um, please let us know. Oh, I'm sure I can come up with a list for you. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> and here we go. Uh, this is the Don't Call It a Lightning Round Lightning round of Final Questions, if you're ready. It's, it's not. We got to find another name. Uh, <laughs> 75 episodes later. Hey, uh, Bino, when was the first time in your life when you realized you had the power of change or the power to do something meaningful? Mm, I was 17 and I had been... Uh, part of a program to, in my small town in Ohio of 20,000 people, uh, I shadowed a city council member and she was kind of moderate, maybe even a little bit Republican. Um, and, um, it turned out at the time that she, you know, they were just expecting to like talk to the high school students and tell them whatever the, there was a proposal to drill for oil in the only Woodland park in my town at the time. And, I uh, ended up mobilizing with a lot of other students, uh, a teacher of mine at school, uh, community members to block the the drilling of oil in the park. And after having a pretty unanimous like pre vote to authorize the drilling, uh, they ended up the initiative ended up failing entirely, and they didn't drill for oil in the park a lot because of our organizing. And it felt like, wow, this is like, this is what you can do when you get people together and when you care enough. That is so rad. That is yeah. super cool. Who is someone in your life that has positively impacted your work in the past six months? Ah, in the past six months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I do feel like my editor, uh, Jake Morrissey, has just been like a huge champion for, and, you know, he's always talking about, he has kids and he's talking about his heirlooms now. So he's really kind of embodied, like he had to live with my book, uh, God bless him, um, for a very long time and edit the whole beast um, multiple times. And so it's been really cool to just hear him talk about it recently and have him be actually taking the practices and ideas and putting them uh 
into action in his own life. And I guess I wasn't exactly expecting that, but it's been kind of gratifying to feel like, oh, there's all this potential for this book. Um, uh, oh, I also, oh God, I have another oh, one. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, well, do you want me to keep going? No, I can't. Let's, no, go ahead. Give it. You already, and, and now everyone out there is going to be sitting there going like, who was it? Was it me? Why didn't she say? I know, right? Well, Jacqueline Novogratz, who's the founder of Acumen, which does patient capital to help poor people around the world start businesses. Um, she is just like, she heard me talk at, I gave a talk at TED and I think she felt bad for me because I had to give the very last talk of the whole week in Vancouver. And then she invited me to talk to a group of women in her home uh, about my book and about the idea of being good ancestors. And it was just like one of the most magical evenings I've ever had in my life. And I don't think I'll, I mean, no offense to you guys, but I don't think I'll ever be like talking to a smarter <laughs> group of people about my book. They were so deeply engaged and so, so like ready to to take this kind of thinking into all of their realms of badass work from uh, leading theater groups to running corporations. And so I think Jacqueline and also Jacqueline, I think she just like sees, sees this idea and sees my book in a way that like just gave me like this huge lift. It was like getting like a big boy of air if you were like paragliding or something. That is pretty wow. awesome. To be clear, if you had said us, I would have said you need better friends. Um, <laughs> we would not have accepted that. <laughs> yeah, no, no chance. All right, Brian, take her home here. Bina, what do you do when you feel overwhelmed? I like to call uh, this. What's Bina time? Mm. Uh, a lot of times I go to Walden Pond. I live about 20 minutes from Walden Pond. And if it's summer, I go for an early morning swim before people get there. And when I'm in Walden, I am like communing with nature. <laughs> I'm being replenished. I'm like being inspired. The way the light like goes through the water there, it looks like you're being, you're like backlit on a green screen, but you're <laughs> underwater. It's just Jeez. super energizing. So for me, like swimming has this, like this ability to make me feel both the power of like being able to glide through the water, being able to do something and like get through whatever I'm going through in my life, but also this like incredible immersive relaxation. I just feel like I'm like back in the womb being surrounded by sure. something really, really uh, like bigger than me. Wow. I love it. Photos of it are very pretty. It's gorgeous. You have to go to Walden. It's the best. Wow. Cool. Yeah. We'll come interrupt um, your swim excellent. one morning. It'll be, you'll think it's super relaxing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you when I'm not going to be there. <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. She had a lot of fun <laughs> today, Brian. <laughs> what, uh, oh, uh, if you could Amazon Prime one book, and I, I mean, I think I might have the answer already, but if you could Amazon Prime one book to Donald Trump, what would it be? <laughs> oh, so many options. We've had past uh, guests who were authors of books uh, say their book, so don't feel bad if you want to. I don't know. See, a part of me wants him to read my book, but a part of me doesn't because my book <laughs> helps people think ahead and like make their plans for the future uh, like you, become reality. You don't want him to do that. That's I'm a good call. Like, you know, it's interesting because the Russians bought the rights, like a Russian publishing company bought foreign rights to my book. Mm. And I was a little bit like, ooh, I hope Putin, do I want Putin to read my book? Like, I don't know. Um, anyway, right. It's but, like Biff um, with the Almanac. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one book. We've had coloring uh, books, the Constitution, everything in between. Uh, no, I just feel like I should have this on the tip of my tongue and I don't. Um, take your time. I should have listened to the end of your episode. Um, oh, now it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get through multiple ones. You know uh, what I mean? Sure. No, 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 no. We got you it listen now. to two good ones. Most of two good ones, Brian. Most, most, sorry, most of two good ones. I think. Uh, did he even care? Does he read? See, um, yes. Uh, look, let's just imagine someone's reading it to him or something like that. Someone's reading it to him. How about we start with something pretty basic level of comprehension, like the Lorax? It's so good. Yes. Lorax, which, by the way, I read to my niece the, um, the week of, it was like a few days after the presidential election of 2016. I read it to my then uh, three-year-old niece and I wept. <laughs> So yeah. I don't know how you could not be moved by that book, but um, worth a try. Worth a try. It's a pretty good one. Well, listen, uh, Bina, where can our listeners follow you on the internet? They can follow me at Bina JV on Twitter and check out the Optimist Telescope. Uh, I think if you just Google that, you'll find me. Uh, you doing a book tour? 
I am. Yeah. Starting in DC at Politics and Prose on the 3rd of September, then uh, Harvard Bookstore in Boston on September 5th, uh, Core Club in New York on September 9th, and on from there, Brooklyn Book Festival, Boston Book Festival. There should be some other places um, in other parts of the country too. Cool. Brian, we'll just yeah. follow you wherever you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I can be like your personal assistant. Whatever you need, just let me know. <laughs> yep. No, I'd love to see you guys if you can make it to, to any of the above. We we will. I think I'll be in LA. I'll be in LA in November. You don't um, need to come to LA. I mean, it's over. Do you know? Do you do you ever go to Summit LA? Do we what? Do you have you ever been to the Summit LA the mm, um, conference? I don't think so. Yeah. Check it out. It seems like it's Summit LA. Okay. Cool. All right. All right. Yeah. We, we got to get out more. Um, <laughs> Bina, this has been fucking great. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for all your time. We kept you for quite a while here. And and for your book, which I just devoured and loved, and I'm clearly going to hand out to quite a lot of people who need it, but not the people that I don't want to have it. That's right. Be very to clarify, clear. That's right. It is. I, we don't need this thing weaponized. Um, <laughs> but I hope it does awesome, and the book tour goes great, and uh, we really appreciate you thinking this way and, and urging everyone else to do it as well. Thank you guys. You guys are fantastic. You're so awesome. It's this a, is a lot of fun. And I really love what you're doing. It means, I think it means a lot and it's, it's making a difference. Thanks to our incredible guest today. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. We hope this episode has made your commute or awesome workout or dishwashing or fucking dog walking late at night that much more pleasant. As a reminder, please subscribe to our free email newsletter at importantnotimportant.com. It is all the news most vital to our survival as a species. And you can follow us all over the internet. You can find us on Twitter at importantnotimp. Uh, just so weird. Also on Facebook and Instagram at Important Not Important, Pinterest and Tumblr, the same thing. So check us out, follow us, share us, like us, you know the deal. And please subscribe to our show wherever you listen to things like this. And if you're really fucking awesome, rate us on Apple Podcasts. Keep the lights on. Thanks. Please. <laughs> and you can find the show notes from today right in your little podcast player and at our website, importantnotimportant.com. Thanks to the very awesome Tim Blaine for our jam and music, to all of you for listening, and finally, most importantly, to our moms for making us. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks.